Hello, everyone. I am very glad to lead this uh, panel discussion here today. And I'm also very glad that the people who are here this morning uh, are part of this panel. I really wanted them to be here. So we have Colonel Ero Rebna, uh, head of the Defence League, Lea Weinolt, and uh, from uh, State uh, Security, and then the Vice uh, Director of the Police and Border Guard Board on the co Customs, and Dauno Surgivi from the Rescue Board. But uh, first, in order to have a kind of a warm up, then um, an introductory question to you. So, if we talk about uh, civil protection and protecting the uh, population in a crisis, uh, then uh, what do we need to be prepared for and how much time do we have? Just a quick answer round. Well, the worst uh, that can happen to us is war. So uh, we need to be prepared for war and we need to see these crises, whether uh, we are able to use the same capabilities during peacetime. We need to be ready for a war tonight which means that we need to be as ready as we can to keep peace and to be uh, those dangerous people for the enemy that they wouldn't want to mess with us. I think we... As Colonel uh, Repo said, we need to be ready for everything. And I was uh, thinking about the storm we had at the weekend, and I was uh, listening to the news yesterday uh, where insurance companies were, uh, when they gave an interview, and if people are not ready for a storm, you know, people were notified to uh, put the furniture from the garden away, and people don't even listen to that. If uh, this storm is a surprise uh, to you, if if every year the snow uh, surprises you, if uh, cyber attacks, uh, people give them give cyber terrorists money every day. So we should start with the small things, and the ultimate goal will be that we have to be ready for war because our neighboring country showed that they're not joking, they really are ready to uh, uh, attack. Veiko, please. Yes, thank you. Well, we need to be needed to be ready a day before yesterday. There's nothing uh, here we that we can wait till tonight or tomorrow. And in the light of all the crisis of the last three years, these have characterized how you would need to be ready. And the latest uh, is uh, from this morning, where all schools receive a mass uh, and medical institution and educational institution received uh, bomb threats. Uh, so yes, indeed, this is a spam attack. But uh, in reality, we need to be ready for the situation where there was a mass evacuation from these and to find this bomb because at one moment this can become reality and we need to be ready for these already yesterday and not wait till tomorrow. And uh, Colonel Weber said we need to be ready for war, but uh, war for me is too abstract of a term. So from a rescue board point of view, we need to be ready for the consequences of war, which means that we must define to ourselves what are uh, the consequences of war and the consequence for the military and the Defence League is their um, activities, but local governments, rescue board, uh, the population, we must understand what are the consequences of war. They are definitely events that we also see during peacetime, whether it's uh, power outages, uh, interruptions to vital services, uh, but the war also brings along other consequences that we don't see during peace, f for example, missile attacks. And uh, so we have a very big uh, task, not that we should start, we're already doing it, but it's very clearly understood what are the consequences of war. 
which of these exist during peacetime and what will uh, jump up. So, for example, if uh, buildings collapse, it's something that doesn't really happen uh, during peacetime, but it does happen during wartime quite often. So, uh, my keyword would be the consequences of war. Yes, uh, very good. It seems that uh, we are ready to discuss these topics, and I will definitely allow people here to ask questions. But I'll move on and uh, uh, come back to the civil protection and uh, the main basics. Although this topic was covered yesterday, that civil protection is nothing new. We have the Geneva Convention, we have uh, the civil protection concept, we have the basics of basis of security policy, everything that uh, um, create a pillar for civil protection and set up the main principles, including uh, how to protect the population during war. And not far from us, we for almost two years, there has been a full-scale war, uh, which is the Russian Federation's full-scale war uh, against the Ukraine. So if we try and interpret what's happening in the Ukraine to us, what can we take from that, considering uh, that our geographical location is a little bit different, our size is different, and also if uh, our crisis preparedness uh, basics are that we presume, we think, that these structures and principles that we create and that function in a normal uh, situation also work in crisis situations. And if you look at what's happening in the Ukraine, how do we interpret? And what are the lessons that we can take from there? Perhaps Lea from the state chancery point of view and the strategical point of view, how uh, do you see it? I believe that the most important uh, on the top level uh, side is that we need to cooperate with countries. Estonia alone shouldn't prepare for itself, but uh, they should cooperate with the Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, who is now a NATO member, because we are uh, much stronger when we're united, whether we talk about trade uh, or uh, sheltering people or something else. So just as the Defence League has been telling for a long time, uh, Baltic is one battleground this is also in the security policy, but uh, also from civil protection, we should move on from that. And the second thing that uh, we could do in Estonia is uh, the preparedness of institutions. So the country is kind of very thin. We uh, are built to uh, fulfill the purposes of peacetime. And I know there's not enough finances, but we need to think through as an, but to think through whether as an employee I know what my tasks are during a crisis and how do I do them when crisis hits, but we should actually spend a little bit more time thinking about them. The small things in the end uh, become one big thing, yes. Eero, what uh, can we take as lessons from the Ukraine? If theoretically we'll be talking about the war being in Estonia. if we see what's happened, uh, happening in the Ukraine, what would be different? I think first and foremost, we shouldn't take uh, Ukraine as a cooking book. The soup uh, was uh, made uh, that way over there. We should actually bring all these items to Estonian context, uh, to our opportunities, because the way our state functions uh, uh, over the last uh, 30 years that we've had over here is, is way different from the Ukraine. I've been there a couple times myself uh, and I've observed uh, over there what 
are the things that we should take over and if we talk about the war in the Ukraine then we should go should go back to 2014 and uh, even uh, before that to see how the hybrid wars took place and how the Ukrainians uh, brains uh, they, they tried to get them uh, they tried to get their way of thinking and uh, we shouldn't also forget about psychological protection and how we build trust not just with state institutions but also with local governments and uh, community leaders i think the reason why y the ukrainians were able to put up resistance uh, much better than in 2014 was that people actually realized that they are also responsibility. There are a lot of volunteers in the Ukraine, especially during the critical moments around the 24th of February. A lot of uh, local governments and non-governmental organizations played their role and uh, this uh, differentiated, uh, differentiated them from 2014 and this is a big lesson for us. We don't have enough people to cover and prepare for a crisis. We need to involve the whole society and to go into that uh, community, local government group and to support the people there uh, so they would actually cope themselves. Yes, thank you. I remember that uh, in September I managed to uh, go to Lviv in, uh, in the Ukraine, so the most western part of Ukraine, who took a lot of um, local uh, refugees, uh, over five million people moved through Lviv or uh, remained there. And when uh, we asked this uh, kind of a crisis regulation main uh, question, but who coordinated, who organized uh, the involvement of the volunteers? And then uh, when for the third time they said, what do you mean we all did? Because the situation required that. Then we, we didn't ask for the fourth time. So the more difficult the situation, the less we'll ask who is in charge of that because it's our state's business so that our states and population would survive. But Veiko, how do you view from an internal security and border security perspective uh, what the Ukrainian lessons? In, in your assessment, what are the most important things for us? Yes, thank you. I would uh, go back in time. Uh, it's all the question is also about uh, what uh, uh, surface this uh, military action can be laid out on our own um, society's preparedness and uh, feel in the context of wha whether our neighboring country have it would make sense for them to spread the war over here and in addition to ukrainian lessons and helping ukrainians the state uh, in parallel has diminished this possibility uh, from accessing information so that people who uh, live in estonia would be uh, in an Estonian information sphere, because that's where it all b begins. As Colonel said before, that 2014 versus now. So how we were able to time it, how much of the society went along with it, if in an Estonian context, 30% of the society should go along with it. And is and it's a completely different picture if they're in our information sphere, if they think like us, if they act like us, it gives a completely different situation. With the Ukraine, the amount of tasks and the fact they cannot be measured uh, that they have had to deal with that we haven't really considered much over here, but that you have to consider in a war situation of war. And these tasks are also with uh, internal uh, security units. Uh, uh, we take war crimes, infiltration. Uh, it's critical 
to have all the pre-intelligence uh, and uh, in involving volunteers, I think, also in helping Ukrainian war refugees. We have some experience and perhaps in the beginning it was a bit uh, rocky. There's a lot of uh, initiative in Estonia. We still have it on a high level. But our skill not to try and do everything ourselves, but to find the groups in our society and the people in our society who are ready to um, put as much effort in. Uh, regarding borders, Two years ago, a um, bit less than two years ago, border guards were the first one who uh, felt the impact and uh, there's uh, things that we need to think through. What will be our activities during this uh, time if we are, if a tank should be in the Luhama border control point and this sets a challenge uh, for any good plans and we also, also know that plans are not good on their own but when if you don't have a plan at all you're failed anyway yesterday uh, it was mentioned that in a crisis all uh, plans go out of the window but uh, Rauno, what about the rescue board's experience regarding Ukraine and uh, civil protection. What would you highlight? First, I would like to create a link uh, between yesterday's presenter uh, Hans Das uh, from the European Commission and today Mr. Das mentioned that um, in Europe, uh, we haven't had an equivalent to 9-11 that the US had. This is what uh, was like a wake-up call for uh, Americans. Europeans, 9-11 uh, was the war in Ukraine, so we got it about 20 years later. And it has sh uh, shaken us quite a lot. This uh, war definitely woke us from this uh, uh, haze where we were still wearing the pink shades of the uh, Geneva Convention that uh, nobody would attack civil um, facilities. The overall understanding of war in the Western society and in Estonia was about how we would wage war by saving uh, civilians. But in Ukraine, we have seen that civilians are the target of attacks. Whether it is rescuers, the civil in infrastructure, electricity, utilities, heating, district heating, facilities. This uh, puts us in a completely different uh, position and uh, we must be ready for something completely different. This is our 9-11. We must think of how to protect rescuers. We need to think uh, in a broader scale. I've gone to different countries but I've never seen a country where the uh, emergency center is not located on the ground or doesn't have a chance to move there quickly. Today uh, Estonia's emergency centers are where uh, we first find out what has happened because people call 112. There are different services that the emergency center offers but today we do not have the capacity of moving the emergency center on the ground but in most countries like mentioned it is on the ground permanently or it can easily be moved there but that's only one example 
looking at the uh, society at large, we are very vulnerable to direct attacks to civilians. For this uh, reason, I noticed that, that uh, in Ukraine they don't uh, mark uh, uh, civilian uh, uh, shelters uh, because uh, then these might become attack uh, uh, places that are attacked first. I think what we should learn from Ukraine is that war is not what's uh, waged between soldiers, but it's um, something that affects uh, the society and all aspects of the society. This is why planning is crucial in order for us all to be in the same information space. If uh, the Defence League is doing something in their underground uh, uh, cellar and they think what the danger is, what the threat is, this is not what we should do. We should all come out of uh, the cellars, be in the same information space and understand what threatens us, how the Defence League affects uh, the civil society, what we must do in order to allow the Defence League to carry out uh, their duties. So it's us as the civil society that can create the space where the Defence League can carry out their activities. But for this we need to plan all together. Plans can go out of the window, but we must have these plans. We must understand what the threats are, how they affect us all, because then we can be better prepared. This was just to continue and I must thought. Beko. I oppose to Downo's idea actually. If if I may. Yes, you are welcome to. Of course, that's uh, one approach. Having emergency centers um, deep underground in concrete, that's one approach. That's something uh, we have seen in the war context. Uh, what we've seen is that those who can be mobile are successful. So maybe those providing information should be more mobile. On the other hand, the awareness of the society is important. What do I need to do apart from calling for help? A lot of people are calling uh, the emergency centre when uh, there is an electricity uh, power cut. Only 15% of the community has uh, got electricity reserves at home. So I would say that we cannot deal with even simple crises on our own, not to mention a military crisis. People themselves need to know the paths to take and they need to think them through. What to do if there is a power cut? Where can I find water? Where can I uh, use the bathroom? These very basic things. Most uh, things in apartments do not work at all if there is no water. And that's why I think everyone should know uh, about these topics. Ero. I am surprised by how surprised uh, other people are that uh, civilians are dying in wars. If we look at uh, wars from the second part of the 20th century, then we can see that most uh, casualties have been civilians. Terrorizing civilians and getting armies to surrender is a very old thought, but now we have people who are even more evil uh, who are applying this uh, weapon in a more uh, widespread uh, scale and we haven't even seen uh, uh, nuclear weapons uh, which are even more brutal. There are just threats at the moment. So we need to look at this war 
from a broader aspect. In addition to the psychological uh, side of things, we also need to think about how we can cope, how we can support those who have been uh, less fortunate. Is our medical system ready for it? One thing that I think we should learn from Ukrainians is how to keep on living in a war situation. We cannot all hide in cellars and under tables. But the way Ukraine has continued with its education, um, economy, at the end of the day they will win this war and uh, it uh, must uh, come to a country that is uh, not uh, um, burnt down, but a country that has continued its activities. Did you hear what the colonel said? The first line of war is civil protection and the second line is the soldiers. Through civil infrastructure, actually uh, uh, the army is being affected, but I don't want to create uh, any uh, mm, false ideas here. Uh, we are all part of broad-scale uh, national protection and we must all be strong so the enemy cannot uh, beat us. If there is one weak link, we have already lost the war. For many years, we have not invested in civil protection, and I'm not only talking about uh, evacuation uh, stock uh, or stockpiling, but I'm talking about uh, investing in people's skills. The key is not shelter, but taking shelter. How people are able to behave if there is an attack, and this is the vital services. What I suggested about an emergency center being underground, that was just an example. It doesn't have to be that. My uh, idea was whether this is protected from the effects of war, whether we are able to create extra reserves in the society. So there are different parties uh, that uh, play a role in making the society ready for war. The keyword preliminary warning uh, was mentioned. Looking at uh, what's happening in Israel, I must ask, would preliminary warnings work in our case? Era. Yes. That was a good short answer. Let's uh, continue. And now before I give uh, the audience a chance to ask their questions, I'd like to ask my last question. War in Ukraine has been going on for quite some time now. And uh, whether we want it or not, at some point a war can become a part of life. News that come from Ukraine are no longer what uh, you read at uh, night time or at uh, just any moment. Is there a danger that in Estonia we might get tired of uh, preparing for war, talking about military topics, about civil protection? What surrounds us is a tense situation, but how can we maintain this uh, level of being alert in a long-term war? Veiko. That's a very good question and a very good um, observation. I think you answered it partly. One part of uh, this activity takes place in Ukraine, but a lot of it takes place outside of Ukraine. As a country, 
we are constantly ready to solve any situations that come up. Let me give you an example. The migration attack organized by Belarus, which uh, has been in the air for the past three years. One of its aims is uh, to burden uh, the countries that are under this flow of migration and uh, the other aim is to test uh, our own uh, reactions and resilience uh, to these uh, occurrences. In the past three years, when the attack started, uh, it is only this year that we can see the increase of numbers. We cannot see any uh, de-escalation. We do not have a border with Belarus, but we've been there in Latvia, in Lithuania, in Poland. And um, in the context of uh, ally uh, relationships, it's important to show them that they are not alone. At the weekend, uh, there were some attack, uh, some uh, situations in uh, the Gulf of Finland, and of, we are still wondering what uh, exactly happened in Israel. Uh, the Hamas attacks and calling uh, for more uh, action in other countries. These are not friendly actions, but uh, these are all events that cause panic to the society. We are in the midst of all this and in the past three to four years we've been very strong. This is what keeps us in form and helps us to uh, avoid any tiredness of the war. Another question is whether all our friends and allies uh, feel the same. Those countries that are further away, will they be still motivated to help Ukraine? I think today they still are. Tauno, uh, in the rescue board, how do we keep uh, uh, vigilance? I'll use this opportunity to argue with uh, Veiko that we're tired of a war. Um, I think I will uh, dispute this. I know. No, I know there's politicians here with us. I'm not sure whether behind the ski screens as well. I've always said that you can talk about anything, but actual priorities are expressed in the numbers. So just a simple example, if we talk about money, if uh, we invested zero euros into civil population for 30 years, and then after the war, one and a half uh, months, uh, they invested uh, 51 millions that uh, we still use to create different uh, capabilities and competences. And now we have this knowledge that we, we got 2.3 million a year, but this is just enough to keep these new competences and for nothing else. So in essence, if we talk about being tired of war, yes, perhaps as a society we're not tired and not rhetorically tired. And perhaps we're not tired. The Defence League uh, Police uh, Rescue Board uh, as institutions, but if we look at uh, different sectors uh, from an investment point of view, then I see tiredness from 51 million to 2.3 million. There's nothing that we can develop in civil protection. We can only train people, which yes, is important, and to train local governments. So in numbers, we can see this tiredness. Leah, how do you see this from the government point of view? As I don't have windows, I don't see very far. But I think it's quite logical that people are tired. It's in their nature. It's in your mental health. Uh, it's best better for your mental health if you don't just surround yourself with the negative all the time. And uh, what information you consume. Yes, the uh, 
that when the war started in the Ukraine, we were all watching the news 24-7. Um, the conflict in uh, Israel, the same for the first 24 hours, we were keeping our eye on it. But uh, there's a limit how much negativity you can handle or, or you want in your life. You would like to look at falling uh, leaves and mushrooms in the forest as well, so we can't... Uh, Uh, we can't just focus on the bad, but we need to find other aspects in our lives. And uh, the last uh, public survey shows that uh, people's support is actually diminishing because there's so much negativity in um, Karabakh, Kosovo, Serbia are not getting along and all the uh, conflicts within Europe now Hamas and Israel, uh, Ukraine, war for almost two years. Everyone is estimating that it will go on uh, through the winter. And then we cannot forget that Taiwan and China are not too friendly with each other either. So there are a lot of conflicts in the world. And as people, we must select the information so we only take in what is necessary to us. But we must not forget that the crises are somewhere out there and we need to be ready for them. So perhaps uh, the focus as a state, I'm not talking about supporting Ukraine, but from our point, uh, the, the crisis, uh, the, the focus should be uh, on it because there's a lot of crisis to actually accept they're actually happening and this uh, pink bubble that we have been in, you know, nothing is happening, nothing is really going on. I remember uh, someone from the rescue board explained why bigger companies don't have generators, uh, but they said, but uh, they said in the risk analysis that uh, the fact that uh, there's a power outage is, is as likely as aliens would uh, come and visit us. So we need to get over uh, that. It's not an alien level thing anymore. There are conflicts. The conflicts are here to stay and we need to be better prepared. But the balance so that we it wouldn't break us, we need to find the balance as well. Ero, how to keep the preparations sharp. It's very easy to me. We should have alternatives. What uh, will happen if we don't, uh, if we're not prepared, if we don't think these things through? And what happens then when we just do nothing and say we're tired? The alternatives are so uh, gruesome that we cannot just do, we, we need to do something. And um, I'm t hearing my colleagues here and how passionate they are, but I'm feeling if we have freedom, if we have opportunities in this life, then we are fighting for the same opportunities and freedom. Then why not continue enjoying them? If I look at our dear colleagues in the Ukraine, then I think that in Lviv, uh, you, you could also see completely normal life, which meant that everyone were possible. The life in the Ukraine went on. And uh, visiting uh, a, a town in the Ukraine, which was very close to the front, and even there, people didn't uh, uh, stop themselves. So they they wanted to go on with their lives. The ice cream truck was still running. The kids were buying ice cream. There were certain security issues, but they really tried to go on with a normal life. So why shouldn't us here in Estonia? Because we would let everyone rest like that, and let's. Go through the alternatives. If those who have retired are seeing that n the Soviet uh, Union will come back. Uh, no, it's a grotesque country where violence and uh, corruption is much bigger. We're not going to go back to uh, 1980, but the violence that Ukraine is under is as cruel, if not crueler, than what our ancestors saw in the 40s. But it's even more gruesome. Yes, indeed, in Lviv, we were the only ones who, when the sirens sounded and it was impossible not to hear the sirens, who then hid in the cellars. People 
carried on in the terraces of coffee shops and uh, went on with the life. So it's kind of this psychological uh, approach to us that uh, even during war, life can go on. That it is possible because today we don't really know what it would mean for us. But now I would really have a question. Uh, I would accept questions from the room. My door, please. Thank you. Uh, next uh, to 12 o'clock next room, we'll have the uh, local governments as an important resource in helping people workshop. Uh, and I would like to get your input in a situation of war. What are the expectations and presumptions that you have? What the local government should do? What tasks do we have? What activities we have? both from a military and uh, civic uh, approach. And then at the workshop, we will discuss whether we're ready for it or not. Thank you. Uh, very good, Maido. A good question. Who would like to answer? Everyone can answer. Let's begin with Ero. Uh, we feel that don't get on our way. And when uh, you are being told, go away, uh, where they say there's no danger, uh, stay here, don't take any opportunities off anyone else. War, unlike with other catastrophes, changes very quickly in time and space, which means we constantly need to have uh, the newest information. And uh, these pre-warnings will happen during the war as well, we will know more. and. Uh, Sometimes the Defence League will come and tell you the situation has changed, leave this place. And uh, they will say that for a good reason. And then also we need to, we have our own mm, intelligence that we cannot disclose. Uh, but trust your country and help me, uh, help us protect our people, our communities. But the impacts of war are not only with bombs. Um, it has a psychological effect in calming people down. People who know you, people who through mass media uh, w perhaps may not trust the information they get, but I see your role to lead the community and the life. And what also we covered before, life must go on, children should be educated, etc., etc. So the tasks that the local governments have you need to carry these on. So it's uh, it's important to retain uh, an opportunity to, to win. And from there on, uh, it's the local government who will help us fight and direct us to the right people. For example, if we're seeking for places where we will could cook for a large amount of soldiers, if we need a temporary hospital, if we need a place where uh, we can store a large amounts of ammunition. So this is, uh, these are the places where throughout the crisis we should have a dialogue. You can't have correct and uh, common guidelines at the beginning of uh, war. You need to uh, manage it w with the communities. Lea, if we take this uh, uh, emergency act, uh, closeness principle, then the local government should be the closest organization, closest to people and helping people. So the local government should uh, be aware of its vulnerable target groups, how to reach them. They should have an overview and a plan. I know that uh, the local government um, organization acts and other legislation uh, have a wide list of the local government's tasks, but uh, we should have an overall idea what can uh, what can be removed. But as the deputy mayor said, uh, should we actually then still keep to our 30-day uh, replies? Uh, and advise locals, or can we actually postpone certain things? 
So priorities. So, so you would know in the local governments, you know who the people are, who are surrounding you, what are the companies, uh, risk uh, organizations, uh, how am I prepared? How do I ensure my uh, vital uh, services in my own territory? And what uh, services provided by the local government I could uh, fulfill to a lesser extent? And with the state, uh, we'll think through uh, how to how this is all legal, how to decrease the capacity, who could support you, and etc. Meiko, what is uh, your uh, order to Maido? Yes, a lot of things have been covered, so I won't go through these again. It's the correct approach that this normal life must go on to the maximum extent, possible extent. It's quite mobile. We need help in informing the population so that the correct messages would go out through the correct channels because uh, we could be in a position where there's no internet, there's no TV, and uh, maybe the courier will bring the correct letter to the correct place. So the other side is p how people are able to cope themselves. So this is to do with the everyday smaller crisis as well. So that each person would know what they have, they have thought through where it's uh, where they will go if a b c scenario will take place and that they would be ready to cope and uh, those who do not cope uh, we should be aware of those too and also to uh, cooperate w um, or, or cooperate with other local governments and take in people from neighboring districts because we see that civil infrastructures are often hit uh, people uh, die in the conditions of war and the ones initially uh, meant to accommodate people may not be there anymore so we need uh, alternatives and very analyzed alternatives Tauno. Uh, so many co correct things have already been highlighted, but two things I'll highlight. First thing, Maido and the others, uh, local government leaders, be prepared. Everything, all the service that uh, you provide, please have the supplies, buy generators, have them in the heating plants, have them for apartment buildings. Think of alternative connections, create uh, networks, so prepare, prepare, prepare. And please don't go into war. But the issue here is that today a lot of local government office officials could be mobilized. And if uh, the local governments often have the tasks of retain your tasks and you will have more tasks during war, but if a lot of them or some of the people there are mobilized, then who will fulfill these tasks? Again, uh, I'm not talking about uh, you can't go into war, you can't go to war, then who will? But the question needs to be solved in society. How on one side are with uh, the small amount of people we have here in Estonia. We would have enough soldiers, but at the same time, this front line of civil protection, the closest unit, uh, the, the local government, would also be manned to fulfill its duties. Today, if I remember, con remember correctly, there's, there's the leader of the local government uh, uh, so Maida, be prepared to be the person who will fulfill all the tasks of the local government. But again, I'm not going to give out any answers, but it's a very important question, how to ensure. So perhaps we should just hire women at local governments. Your neighbor is there. She probably won't be mobili mobilized. 
Now I would like to give the chance to those in the audience to ask questions as well. Thank you. I'm from Parno, head of the civil protection unit. There are a lot of threats. We have storms, floods in Parno. We also have hot girls in the beach. This uh, 51 million that uh, you were given, I wonder where this all went. I experienced in the committee uh, where I work that we will have a paid uh, staff member that will only focus on civil protection topics. I looked at the committee yesterday, I um, uh, listened to yesterday's conference, I'm listening to you, but you are all professionals, yet you are all part of a puzzle. I don't think this uh, trapeze metaphor is right. I think we need a triangle someone needs to put together the whole picture and find the right solution. I'm not talking about whether we need shelters, uh, whether uh, the war will be with missiles or an atomic war. But my question is, in a war situation, under which ministry should civil protection belong? Who should provide funding for this? What is your opinion? Which ministry should be in charge of civil protection? Lea, government office. I don't want to avoid the question, but I think it can't be just one ministry's responsibility area, because the Ministry of Internal Affairs can't pay for um, disaster medicine and uh, the Ministry of Social affairs uh, can't uh, carry out uh, rescue work. So I think uh, the one in charge uh, should be the government office. We also have uh, space for development, but at the moment we are putting together a plan for civil protection, which includes uh, the civil protection topics. What about in war environment? In a war in uh, situation. The uh, civil protection uh, should be under the uh, auspices of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and we will see if we will include it in our plan as well. Like Dooley said, uh, if there is a crisis we will all do uh, make an effort as much as we can, but the Ministry of Internal Affairs will be uh, currently in charge of uh, civil protection. Don't know. I have quite a long experience in uh, solving crises, and if I've uh, learned uh, something, there's one thing alone. If in different crises you start uh, changing things completely, then this is an early failure. In crises, only the solutions uh, that uh, work in peacetime will work. So our challenge is how to continue providing peacetime services in a context of crisis. You talked about war context, uh, but uh, it could be any crisis. If in crisis time we uh, deviate completely from a peacetime uh, way of doing things, then it will simply not work. In uh, minor crises, I've seen that uh, also in major ones, if we try to change uh, communication and management uh, uh, methods uh, all together, then uh, if we haven't practiced this uh, daily, then it simply will not work. It might seem like a good idea that uh, we have this uh, uh, clever person who will somehow mm, come up with magical solutions, but if this person is killed, then there is nothing to do. I think crisis management should be uh, uh, carried out as broadly as possible, and only then can it be sustainable. Ero. Well, 
There are some who say that uh, war is too important to leave it uh, only for people in uniform to deal with. And these people are right to say it. If we are faced with an existential crisis, decisions must be made at a level as high as possible. We understand that decisions in such situations are not business as usual because stakes are so high, we must have a higher management level of the state, a governance level here. Looking at um, wartime uh, management, we have already uh, given some of our sovereignty to international organizations such as NATO. And our uh, governance can affect these decisions. But for that, we need to have the involvement of the highest level governance. They need to be uh, given the information and uh, have the methods for making important decisions. And for that, as was mentioned, preparations must be made in peacetime. We need to practice anything that might be necessary during war time and we need to analyze what effect uh, these actions have. Beko, anything from the police? Yes, Dauna mentioned that if um, we uh, manage crisis, uh, well, that we should manage crisis uh, just like we uh, do manage normal situations, but I don't think we have capacity of crisis management at the state level, each of us. The example of uh, Ukrainian refugees, for instance, at the beginning, uh, we uh, tried uh, giving the responsibility to those who are in charge of uh, similar topics on a daily basis. But the fact is that if there are no daily crises, then it's very difficult if there is a crisis and you suddenly have to lead the solutions at the state level. I think that would put you in a very complicated situation and the decisions made in such context emergency uh, plans uh, and all the elements uh, which are required for solving the situation were already there. They were adapted, but still the crisis management of managing the situation went in another direction. I often uh, hear the question whether all uh, state institutions uh, should manage a crisis or if there are some institutions that are simply better prepared for it because of their daily work, because of their level of preparedness. Of course, I'm not saying that some should be left out completely. Everyone has different competences. I would like to um, discuss follow this discussion, continue it. Uh, I generally agree, but in a war context, uh, police was able to uh, support crisis management because you didn't have other um, tasks at this point. But if your resources are already depleted because of managing your own operations, then you will obviously not have resources to help someone else. In peacetime, yes, organizations uh, that have experience in uh, crisis can support each other, but in a war situation we are all alone. I agree that there should be coordination, top-level uh, management, governance, but all organizations uh, need uh, to have the chance uh, to be to have a say in uh, how things in their sector are being organized 
Indeed, during a war, we all lack resources, and uh, the question is how we are able to solve a situation in such a lack of um, resources. The discussion we just heard showed me that uh, we need higher level governance. You talked about who is responsible for what, but that's precisely why we need higher level governance and very clear priorities to be set. We are working on this today, we will keep working on this tomorrow. And some decisions not to take action also have a great impact today as well as tomorrow. And uh, these decisions must be made at the level where political responsibility is taken. This is why higher level governance is needed and we must understand that we are not all uh, just solving our own problems. Perhaps at some point we must help other institutions and then change uh, who we help at some point. That's why we need central governance to be in charge of this. Leon, please. It's very important to understand what uh, management, what uh, governance, what coordination all mean. If we asked uh, in the room as well, I'm sure that we would have more than uh, three opinions about what all of these terms exactly mean. Each uh, institution alone knows exactly what their re resources are. So the Defence League cannot be in charge of the health board or the rescue service cannot uh, be in charge of uh, what's happening in the central hospital. These are perhaps extreme examples, but my point is that each institution is responsible for their own activities. And now we need coordination where there is a general point of view. Of course, it is the government that sets priorities and um, goals. And then ministries need to decide how to proceed precisely in each of the sectors. But everyone must cooperate. We cannot say that one ministry will be in charge of everything because they know everything. Ero, you wanted to add something. I feel that finally we were able to uh, reach an intrigue that uh, causes some uh, debate in this uh, panel. The COVID crisis was probably a good practice for the police and border guard board because it created a situation where in the defense league we sent a lot of our own people to help uh, others to support others it's not that we went uh, to a hospital or to the police um, and said that we would now be in charge but we were there available to help waiting for tasks and ready to carry them out. I think uh, what we saw in COVID is how the state should behave only in much larger scale. There must be central governance and experts must be allowed to give advice to do their expert work. I do not think that the local uh, government's uh, head in uh, Rakvara town would be able to take charge of uh, the whole country. But I think we need to know exactly what each other's capacities are and what we can expect and, uh, and what we cannot. There are sometimes very high expectations towards uh, people who wear uniforms and uh, taxpayers seem to believe that uh, we have endless resources of people who will just come and solve the issues. 
I'm very glad to see that uh, we have such a lively debate in the panel, but now, because I see a lot of hands uh, in the room, I will take a few more questions. I hope Berno received a reply, including where the 50 million euros was invested. And I'm very glad to hear that uh, someone will be in charge of uh, crisis and uh, civil protection in Berno. Next question, please. What happens to people's critical thinking in a war context and how can the state help people? Who would like to answer? How can we support people in crisis using critical thinking? This is a very deep question. Critical thinking is something that people must be taught early on. It's not something that can begin in a crisis situation, especially if it's remote. What the state can do to foster critical thinking is to give people information to proceed with. Propaganda, if it's our own, it's welcome, but it must not uh, hide facts and it must not take away the person's possibility for of, uh, critical thinking. Spreading information well, uh, doesn't uh, automatically make people think critically. But the skill, because the skill of critical thinking should be there before a crisis. Uh, not sure if I understood the question uh, exactly, but I'll again uh, create the bridge back to yesterday. I, I'd like to support uh, the colonel here. I can't remember who it was, but someone said that if we're talking about the dangers of war to people, then it always has a comma but we don't have it and it won't happen uh, here. So forget everything that happens after the comma because I don't know why we uh, keep believing that people will uh, start to panic when you tell them the truth. I've never seen this happen, but somehow uh, people feel that if we tell them the truth, then all panic will break loose. This has not been proved in real life. So we should tell people the truth, both in the preparation phase and also during the active phase. And people have to have the tools, not just that I will tell you the truth and now see how you will manage, but I will tell you the truth and I will give you advice what you should do uh, just in the preparation phase. Because if people are prepared and they can only prepare if they know the actual risks and uh, they can uh, they can actually come to life, not just that it will never happen here. So it will definitely help. But uh, at the same uh, time, during COVID, all the shops were cleared out of toilet paper because people kind of did what they found easiest to do. They went to the shop and bought toilet paper. So where was the critical thinking there? If you wanted to say it was panic, then in such panic, uh, I'd like, like to live in such panic. It is actually that we're again uh, afraid that people will buy all the food from the shop. Why people bought toilet paper, I really don't know. Maybe this was just lack of information. People weren't advised what to, to buy and wanting to do something, people then bought toilet paper. But if we have uh, this uh, panic of shopping and they buy all the rice and buckwheat and everything, bring it home and they create a uh, a seven-day pre preparation before crisis, then in such panic and crisis, that's what I'd like to experience. This is panic. Uh, what we should avoid is people coming to the street. Uh, uh, but panic in a sense that to have necessary supplies at home, this, this is just great. Yeah, the technical side I'd like to add. We need to uh, rehearse people to... Uh, 
consume channels where the state will provide them with the correct information. If we say today that uh, listen to the public broadcast channels, then this is where you will have this controlled information and uh, no flat uh, earth uh, information will be shared. So this could be one of the options how we manage this uh, critical thinking of people and the correct consumption of uh, information and, and what we as the state must do is is to ensure that these channels would be operating in the regarding physical protection whether they are in this one physical location or as people said they're mobile because uh, the national TV channel could actually broadcast from Buru and Sarem, also different parts of Estonia. So this is uh, what we're already doing as a state today and we can carry on during a crisis. Yes, I think that listen to the state, uh, we, we need to be prepared as a state that we won't fail here. Because if you listen to the state, but... Uh, do not receive correct information the next time you won't listen to them. So for us as a country, it gives us uh, high expectations. But uh, Veiko, how critical thinking on your side? First knowledge should be acquired at school, uh, which is vital for everyday uh, coping skills and also important in crisis situations. Uh, so this adequate information should be from the correct controlled source and uh, the responsibility for the information um, provider is, is much higher. What will have a critical mass of people in the society who can you can tell them anything you like but they will have their take their own truth from somewhere we see that in the everyday uh, uh, cases as well if you receive a phone call don't give your money to uh, cyber criminals uh, don't drink certain drinks they're not gonna cure you so we'll have we'll always have these people uh, but information from the right source, with from the right weight, is uh, we can do that, and uh, we need to learn at school. We still have those uh, as part of the curricula. Uh, I saw that uh, someone else wants to ask a question here. I talked to you yesterday about use of science. And if I look at the um, text of this today's discussion, protection of the residents, okay? I think it's a matter of time and a matter of consciousness. Time meaning the government's responsibility in this case. I'm sure you are very well prepared in all ways and don't like to disclose any security issues. And I don't know what you are prepared for, so I have to look at it from my point of view. And that is like in the North Sea on a rig, as I told you yesterday, um, they have to show how much time is available if you are hit by an explosion, etc. Do you have enough time for evacuation? So I believe a mass evacuation, What? where should people go? And should you start for a long-term planning of shelters like they have in Finland, for example? That's a part of the building code in Finland. Uh, something in the long term. Consciousness, you started with that question because we have so far talked about it from your point of view. But m move this over to the citizens. What they need not to be naive anymore. So how do you prepare them to what I uh, mentioned yesterday about uh, pandemics, what we call participatory governance? How can they be more conscious, being involved in the loop, and know what they do, where do they go, and that you have a macro um, uh, evaluation looking at science what can hit, where will it hit, 
and where can people be protected from that point. So two points, use signs in order to see how much time is available and use citizen and make them consciousness about their own situation. I know that's a risky thing because you don't want to scare them. And as you mentioned, start with the school and do this in the long term. We still have time, but I mean the Israeli attack by Hamas was a wake-up call. The Americans, why didn't they know things about this beforehand? And do we know everything? And I'm sure that Putin is doing everything he knows know about the Israeli attack by Hamas because he's getting more and more desperate as he's not winning Ukraine. So what will he do next? So those things, uh, two things, time and consciousness. No nii, et küsimus siis ajastuses ja... So a question about timing and uh, preparedness of people, psychological preparedness uh, that we have managed to cover in our discussions. But again, what are your... Uh, what would you... What, what are your ideas to these questions, Eero? I think that we are following the right direction. I'm not saying that we're there yet. We are telling our people how we try to get people to think along what are different crises and how to handle different crises. And I think one right uh, move is that uh, as a state we have decided that we're educating our people in secondary school about different uh, state security measures and this year is part of the curricula so we can get the whole age group uh, involved and I also believe that uh, a child that goes home or a young adult if we talk about secondary stu school sc students <coughs> they are the ones who help the whole family to prepare for crisis, bring new information and get other family members involved. What happens if, in addition, different voluntary groups in Estonia that um, raise awareness and uh, have discussions are going over the top? For example, how the Defence League uh, Women's Voluntary Group uh, uh, with the rescue board uh, the work, this is very good, but is it, the question is, is it enough to reach all the places? Yes, uh, the question to the last three questions is no, but should we carry on? Yes, we should carry on. And if our people understand what they should be afraid of, and we reach the point that we uh, show, we set uh, an example and we're role models, how to function concerning uh, times. We're not talking about uh, single incidents. We should have a, a statewide strategy and even mentally we should be prepared for a very long where uh, the war doesn't happen for five, six days and uh, our whole conversation about we are a small country can be true, but we are uh, a part of a very large military block and so get it to work, uh, that will take time and uh, this time in a sense we need to buy for our allies and we need to understand what risks come with it and what uh, harm can be done to the population if we fail. And we should also think about plan B and plan C and tell uh, people things honestly, but that we have already done in Estonia. Yes, when you highlighted that uh, state security studies are mandatory in, in secondary schools, then what are these behavioral theories showing from what age can, uh, can people's crisis behavior be changed? And the answers are that uh, these uh, are children between, uh, or, or aged around 10, they're young mothers, and certain groups, uh, so with different targets, you can have different work and to reach how it would be possible to change crisis behavior. And clearly, there are no quick solutions. Uh, be naive to expect them. Tauno, uh, yes. 
the change in paradigm in Estonia, it has already happened. One of the impacts of war is that we can use the word war in our society. Before we try to kind of wiggle about and talk about uh, state security crisis and whatever we were talking about, we can now say the wo word war and we can uh, talk about getting ready, prepared for war. When we, you know, practical example, I think it was 2018 when we st wanted to publish, uh, we, we, we published this first uh, Be Ready uh, booklet that we sent out to people. Then initially this project included uh, getting uh, prepared for war. And on a very high political level, we had a uh, ban not to use these chapters, but at the same time uh, in Sweden that uh, they are uh, like security wise in a safer place than we are. And they had the same booklet published if crisis or war comes. So one of the paradigm changes is that we are brave enough to use the word war and we can talk about getting prepared for war. So this has already happened in Estonia and also uh, getting prepared. This is uh, another, uh, well, if not the most important part, if before we lived in the knowledge that uh, getting, prepared to getting prepared for a peacetime crisis, for example, electricity, that will also function in war. Then obviously we have uh, very war specific uh, preparation methods and it's important that we We'll talk about that as well. So we, the question was asked about the Finnish construction code where uh, the shelters come uh, with uh, the buildings if they're larger than uh, 1,600 square meters. But we also must uh, make preparation for war. Veiko, uh, what do you have to add? Uh, again, I'd like to compare us to Finland. We have a common... Uh, shelter number that we filled, we are li missing a million. This is the real life, but uh, I agree with previous speakers that uh, we are uh, more brave to talk about it. We're talking about what is war in our society, but the actual behavior is not quite there yet. There's a long way to go. Perhaps the same safety uh, belt example, if you have a child in the car that you um, put the seat belt on them all the time, then that would also remind you to put your seat belt on. It's the same example that at school we're teaching young people that uh, they would be, that the future generation would cope than the existing one. But the uh, generations who don't think like that, if we would reach them as well. So we had a couple of elements there through different volunteer organizations, for example, like Maido through local governments. Uh, there are opportunities there how to uh, carry this message across. And on the other side, uh, we are facing real figures of 15% in crisis preparedness. So we're not there yet. Lea, would you also like to reflect on this uh, question? I think uh, informing young people is something that we could do better in the sense that uh, civil protection classes, yes, they do exist in secondary school now, but uh, preparing for war, uh, for crisis, is also about uh, basic uh, manual skills, such as holding, using a saw, uh, putting nails in the wall, uh, using a spade for digging the ground. I've heard that some boys go to um, con uh, conscription and uh, they can't get uh, shoes with laces on because they are looking for velcro strips. We are living in an IT world where our thumbs are very mobile and uh, our school results are great. Uh, we have top results in PISA tests 
but the practical skills that you need in a war context in these we are not very strong and I think that more resources should be dedicated uh, to that thank you and one more quick question from the audience thank you I am an outside observer you could say I'm not a member of any uh, uh, structures I am a chaplain at uh, the Academy of Security Sciences one thought I had while listening to this uh, panel is that uh, we are looking at uh, service providers uh, sitting uh, in the room and uh, local governments are also service providers but when it comes to civil protection and local view we could uh, we should think that this is not service every person should be able to survive themselves and that's something we have forgotten yes we have civil uh, protection uh, classes in uh, secondary schools uh, but we should also have survival classes as individuals as uh, the society we expect to receive everything as services but then in a crisis would we be sitting uh, in our armchair waiting for the service provider to arrive in a way uh, recent uh, situations such as uh, climate uh, disasters and the covid crisis have shown that we have people among us who are willing to take responsibility and who are willing to go and help simply as members of the community that's something we should uh, pay more attention to in the society a village community must uh, be able to cope perhaps even without anybody else intervening state level services is one thing but they should be more about uh, guidelines for each citizen there should be a basic understanding of how they would survive in situation A or B that's a long journey but that was my idea thank you for this uh, brief question so how to get uh, the service of civil protection into people's uh, minds how to change mindsets I wouldn't um, uh, say these are opposing um, ideas. I don't think the states uh, providing uh, services uh, should mean that people shouldn't be ready at home and that they shouldn't contribute actively during crises. I think the Estonian uh, society has proved uh, several times uh, uh, what uh, they can do. Uh, for instance, during uh, the uh, refugee crisis, we had lots of volunteers who were willing to help. But this takes me back to the state uh, side of things. Uh, and I want to ask who is offering a coordination service for uh, volunteers. Everyone was willing to take their passenger car, go to the uh, Ukrainian border and bring a family uh, to Estonia, but then eventually someone would have to welcome the family, someone would have to do the next steps. I think uh, both sides should work together. I think uh, uh, the state level services uh, should uh, provide uh, uh, instruction for uh, volunteers and provide information that it's important to help others. I think uh, today we haven't heard much uh, the word cooperation, but I think uh, individuals and services should also cooperate. Now we have one and a half minutes remaining. Let's have a quick um, a round of conclusions. Uh, I'm going to ask everyone the same question and I would like to have very quick answers. In the coming years, uh, our budget is uh, not uh, great, but civil protection is important. As uh, our discussion showed, what is one thing that must uh, be done. Era. People's trust. People 
being sure that uh, we are not uh, telling them lies, that we are doing the real thing. The correct information space, uh, sharing uh, right information and finding the channels of getting to people. Awareness among people and cooperation. I liked uh, what uh, one uh, person uh, mentioned, the English word consciousness. I would like to finish with this. If we have consciousness in the society, we have already made a great leap. Thank you uh, so much for this interesting uh, panel discussion. I uh, feel very uh, inspired to move forward. I feel that we have a good uh, cooperation and we will be able to overcome any crisis. Thank you. And, uh, I would now like to remind you that it's time for a coffee break. You have 45 minutes to uh, have a cup of coffee and uh, choose the next uh, panel discussion you would like to listen to. Good afternoon. This workshop focuses on research, education and innovation in the next 30 years. We will talk about uh, how education should be given in the Academy of Security Science so that it keeps up with the requirements of the state and uh, the international uh, situation. We have here Christi Oniste, Estonian contract point of the European Migration Network from our academy. Brit Suba, professor at the Center of Law and Social Sciences at the Academy of Security Sciences. And Greta Arro, researcher at the School of Educational Sciences and advisor of educational psychology at the Ministry of Education and Research. We will have uh, a chance for each uh, speaker to speak for 10 to 15 minutes followed by a discussion where uh, we can uh, receive questions uh, from the room as well as online. We also have interpretation into English, uh, so you may ask either in Estonian or in English, either from the room or on WorkSup. We will uh, now go from the specific to the broad and uh, first uh, talk about um, learning migration, what it means for Estonia and uh, how the profile of uh, learners is changing. Christy. Good afternoon. Can you hear me well? I would like to uh, talk about um, learning mobility, trends, policies and uh, challenges uh, for other countries as well as Estonia. First of all, the internationalization of higher education and uh, learning mobility is uh, are important topics for most developed countries. Why are they important? Here are some of the reasons. Firstly, it promotes education because uh, foreign uh, students often pay higher uh, fees and uh, they also uh, pay for uh, accommodation, transport and services in the country where they are studying. Secondly, it uh, creates uh, new jobs, for instance, uh, 
Uh, there are more jobs that are required in the education, in accommodation, in um, uh, commercial sector, because uh, these foreign students are also consuming these services. So this uh, reduces uh, unemployment in a country. Thirdly, cultural diversity. This is something that uh, foreign students help to promote in a country. They help uh, different cultures to understand each other better and uh, promote tolerance in a country, as well as global thinking. Four, it uh, helps uh, to improve uh, the reputation of the education system and educational institutions. Uh, if there are foreign students uh, in an institution or in a uh, state, uh, this uh, is attractive for more foreign students to come. And uh, finally, uh, research and innovation that uh, is brought by internationalization. Small countries may not always have the skills uh, that we can then uh, get from abroad, and this promotes uh, local uh, research and uh, industry. It's important to mention that if foreign students want to stay in a country of destination, they are very good at integrating, they have already lived in the country for some time, they often know the local culture and language, and if they want to stay to work in the country of destination, they will be uh, young and edu well-educated um, employees. They pay taxes, but at the same time they use uh, quite few services, and uh, this is uh, an advantage for the state if uh, students who have studied here want to stay to work. But if they leave after their studies, uh, it is also useful for the state because uh, they um, become ambassadors of, their, um, of the country where they studied wherever they go next and uh, it can be useful for new uh, business uh, relations uh, as well however there is there are also some threats mm. for instance um, pressure regarding uh, different uh, services and resources. There could be uh, conflicts between locals and um, uh, foreign students uh, when it comes to accommodation, transport, healthcare services and jobs. Secondly, if uh, the foreign uh, students are not able to uh, integrate, uh, if they uh, uh, remain uh, in cultural and language uh, barrier situations, then um, this could uh, result in something opposite uh, than integration. It could lead to social isolation. these issues. In the European Union we have free mov mov movement of uh, people, which means that uh, you don't need a visa or a residence permit to study in another country, so we cannot regulate um, the arrival of uh, European students uh, that much. But um, the EU has adopted a directive uh, regarding the entry and the studies of uh, individuals from third countries. This uh, directive uh, regulates um, threats and uh, provides guidelines for alleviating them. The general condition is that uh, the applicant must have uh, grounds in order to enter uh, another country, uh, for instance, a uh, residence permit or a long-term visa. And there are also specific uh, conditions um, which uh, some institutions use. For instance, proof of payment of uh, l uh, study fees, proof of language uh, level, 
some uh, use a proof, uh, some use an uh, interview, or also proof uh, that a uh, student has sufficient resources uh, for um, living in the country. Usually uh, this uh, proof uh, should cover one, uh, funds for one year and also proof of uh, um, being accepted into a university. The reason to uh, not uh, accept a foreign student is if they are, for example, if they have um, uh, falsified documents, if there is uh, grounds to believe that um, the a student wants uh, something else rather than to study in the country and uh, in Estonia it is possible you have your health uh, insurance. Students uh, that arrive in Estonia are generally uh, required uh, to um, enter their address in the population register. We do not uh, require language uh, certificates uh, as a country, but uh, students uh, chosen university may ask for such proof. Looking at uh, policies uh, that uh, uh, guide uh, learning migration, in a lot of uh, Western countries, uh, uh, the focus is on attracting uh, talented young people and supporting the internationalization of uh, higher education. Therefore, admission um, and application processes have been simplified and uh, international uh, students are encouraged to stay to work uh, in the country after they've finished their studies. For instance, in Canada, Australia, the UK, uh, in Sweden, uh, Holland and other countries after having finished your studies, uh, you will have a residence permit uh, for one or two years in uh, simplified, under simplified conditions in order to give you time to find a job. Estonian uh, Education Development uh, Plan uh, for 2021 to 2035 also aims uh, to uh, promote uh, learning migration and internationalization. Yet uh, our migration policy is uh, rather conservative and this is also um, shown in uh, learning migration. For instance, we don't allow uh, alumni from other countries uh, to uh, stay in Estonia under simplified conditions. And um, the Aliens Act uh, also was changed uh, in May 2022. According to a change, is um, the visa and the residence permit uh, could only uh, be given if the student was to study at an accredited higher education institution. That is the result of a um, situation where uh, an institution received a number of uh, foreign students, uh, but they uh, did not give them high quality education and eventually the institution was uh, closed down. So. Uh, this could be uh, a threat as well. Something uh, limiting is also if a foreign student uh, is uh, married and, um, uh, and now the spouse can only apply for residence permit if uh, uh, the, their spouse who is the student has lived in Estonia for at least two years, except in case of doctoral studies.
This is because the police and border guard board uh, found that there were a number of uh, students from third countries who were not coping well in their studies. They didn't have a good enough education level or uh, learning language uh, skills. They stopped their studies and uh, they had already uh, brought uh, their uh, spouse. So this new condition should uh, make sure that uh, the student is able to complete their studies and also support their family. The final uh, condition is that if uh, the uh, term-based uh, residence permit uh, is um, cancelled, uh, the student has 30 days to apply for a different uh, residence permit or to leave the country. Some statistics about um, uh, learning migration. The number of uh, foreign students uh, grew in Estonia up to the year 2019, which is when Estonia had uh, the highest uh, number of, uh, a record number of uh, foreign students. Due to COVID, the number of foreign students started to decrease again. And um, in uh, 2022, when most COVID restrictions had been lifted. The number of uh, foreign students continued to decrease and that was mainly uh, because of the uh, because of uh, students from Russia and Belarus not being accepted into Estonian universities. And <clears throat> as you can see from the slide, then most uh, foreign students that w we have in Estonia, then they already have a higher education. They either have a, a master's, they're in ma doing the master's or a PhD studies. And their background, it's quite versatile. They're from uh, 124 countries, so mostly uh, the biggest amount has always been from uh, Finland. And then in 2022, uh, the most other uh, significant countries were the Ukraine, Russia, Nigeria, India, Azerbaijan, Pakistan, Latvia, Turkey and the United States. And uh, compared to the previous uh, year, uh, admissions dropped mostly in uh, Russian, Latvian and Azerbaijanian uh, students but more students join from the Ukraine and Turkey. And if we look at different continents, compared to 2016, then by 2022, uh, there doubled the students from uh, Amer America, Northern America, and then there's less uh, uh, from Asia or uh, more from Asia as well. And uh, half of the foreign students are men, half are women. Now the study fields, it's uh, business, administration and law, but also humanitarian subjects, arts, and then uh, information and communication technologies. Most uh, students study in uh, English, and a small percentage in Estonian and Russian curriculars. And foreign students uh, make up of 11% uh, of Estonian students. Uh, foreign students in Estonia have the right to work in Estonia. Uh, and over half of them are actually employed. Uh, during their studies. Uh, this doesn't mean that they work full time and with an employment contract, but there are different ways of working and they work. Uh, it's mostly men who work on uh, IT subjects and mostly students from Africa. And the year following graduation, about 63 percent of foreign uh, alumni were employed in Estonia. So a lot of uh, students actually remain to here and work in Estonia. And most often uh, uh, of the alumni, it's uh, mostly men and those who are in IT. And the opinion that uh, 
foreign alumni uh, should be working uh, from uh, short-term uh, work contracts. Uh, it's not common. They should w they w should work with an employment contract. And the more years have passed graduation, the less the people who are temporarily employed. And uh, out of the changes that have taken place over the last couple of years, it's important to see what has happened with foreign students from third countries. Then we look about residency permits that have been uh, first time permits that have been issued for studying. Not the total amount of foreign students. And here we see that if in 2016, uh, out of third countries, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Ukrainian citizens uh, prevailed, then uh, after that, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nigeria, and India citizens have uh, increased. And as you can see, there's also some risk countries in there. Which is, in, and therefore, it's important to keep the dangers in mind that uh, come with uh, those, like, for example, uh, segregations. If we have a lot of people from one and the same country, then they don't want to integrate, they don't s uh, learn the language, and etc. And therefore, it's uh, difficult to uh, have them in our information sphere, and often that they can misuse their permits, they don't wish to study here, or the Euro Academy example where the same case that they come here to study, but they actually then come here to live and work. And the migration also includes the secondary migration, so they often wish to bring their uh, spouse and, and uh, remain to live here in Estonia. And these are also the uh, uh, amendments in the Alien Act that have also been implemented. So how do we find this balance to benefit from uh, these learning, uh, the learning mobility but to mitigate the possible dangers that uh, um, are tied to it. So different countries have used different measures. In the US with risk countries, there are uh, double checks so that uh, they, it's very difficult for them to get the study visa. In Canada, for example, has made agreements with specific countries where and people coming from there, they will get a, the visa um, or a residency permit uh, quicker. I'm just trying to remember if there are good examples from other countries as well. And that it's also possible that, uh, for example, France won't ask some countries uh, for proof that you have uh, income to live in the country. they prefer uh, migration from certain uh, countries, but then limit some other countries. So these are some of the measures that uh, countries use. But at the same time, the learning uh, mobility legislation should also think uh, of uh, the future of higher education, because on one side it's digitalization, so it becomes more effective. Uh, you can teach so many more students with the same cost, and perhaps in the future we can... Uh, the foreigners who are interested to study in Estonian universities, uh, we can teach them online. And then uh, the internationalization. So all countries are interested in foreign students if 20... 2001, we had uh, 
million uh, international students uh, in the world and now we have 6.3 million and by 2030 it will be over eight uh, estimated to be over eight million international students so uh, the amount of students is increasing and it's a challenge for the universities and the students how to be more attractive to students and how to teach them because uh, there is a lot of competition then a personalized uh, solution and flexibility at universities because uh, because uh, people's uh, expect that uh, life years are longer they s change their jobs more often they make career changes so students today don't are not the common bachelor's plus m master's teacher who uh, who are straight from school because by that some of them already have a family and the learners are m much more versatile and therefore they may need a more uh, personalized uh, approach and then there's the questions whether we also provide the foreign students with those and uh, the last I think is the uh, how is the uh, higher education in accordance with the society's needs and uh, can we meet those uh, needs with foreign students as well do we encourage uh, some uh, specialties uh, for foreign students and we won't for we will waive the tuition fee for example so this could is, is also one of the key topics for the future well thank you i'm a little bit over time sorry Thank you, Christy. I understand that a large part of sources say that uh, future is globalization, which means that uh, there are more uh, foreign students in Estonia. And thank you for this overview that showed uh, that we, we really have uh, more people coming from Europe, but also from third world countries. And uh, it's even more noticeable. So how do you assess uh, these changes over the next 30 years, in your opinion, uh, will affect uh, internal, uh, will also be part of internal security curricula? What should we consider? We are, today we are quite uh, Estonian-centered in our teaching, but we also have Erasmus students here, we have a I've had students in the master's uh, program from Finland. So what should we consider in uh, uh, 30 years in our I internal security studies? The, if the, whether the changes get here or not, this is, is this up to us or this is uh, the internal security uh, specialists uh, decision whether we want to have uh, people from third uh, countries to work in the field? How does the law uh, provide? And uh, I think that will actually uh, uh, design uh, the um, learning mobility in that field. Are there any questions here? Please uh, raise your hand, uh, Christina, and then is, is uh, ready to bring the microphone. Uh, the main topic is uh, innovation and how to develop the system, then I would uh, go a bit backwards. Uh, Estonian students abroad, so that they are studying abroad and they are studying the environment and bring something back. From that point of view, how is that functioning? Are they successful there? Is it working? Are they gaining more knowledge? Are they bringing something with them? Yes, they bring a lot uh, to us. It's a small country. It's not even possible to study on some uh, subject, uh, study some subjects here. And it's also a goal for the state and the education ministry. It's the second uh, part of this. I only talked about learning mobility. So the people, uh, the students that come over here to Estonia, but uh, that Estonian youth could study abroad is, is equally important. And the state really supports that. Thank you. One more question. Veiko from the 
academic security sciences. From a state point of view, do we have a strategy for countries where we know that in the future there is potential for in technology and innovation very high? So we would uh, uh, have a greater and more targeted work with those countries to get students from them. For example, India, which is a f the China of the future. Do we have those kind of national plans? Uh, not to my knowledge. Thank you. Uh, for those online uh, works w with works up, uh, that also enables you to ask questions, but so far no question. But there is another question here. Hi, um, Irina from the Police and Border Guard Board. My question is that in 2016, I graduated from the Estonian Art Academy master's degree and we had several students from abroad. So uh, uh, teachers often spoke uh, English uh, and for those of us who wanted to study in Estonian, uh, the question was that uh, how to do it, uh, that um, how to make foreign students happy and us receive education in Estonian in the state language. Do you observe these things or what's, what's the input for schools? For example, if the course is in Estonian, should they then speak in English or what's the solution? We have curriculums and they state in which language they are there Eng in English, in Estonian, some even in Russian. So generally, the s teachers should follow that and, and foreign students should then receive uh, uh, or, or would be able to participate in a course where they speak the language. So maybe the specific case was that the foreign student thought that their uh, language skills were sufficient in Estonian to participate. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Christy. We have understood and that the future may be uh, globalization. And one of the trend uh, analyzers have uh, has also said it could be a little bit scattered. So we can't really predict that. And we can't decide uh, that in 30 years whom we'll accept and whom we won't. But today we are designing this future and what will happen in two years from now, five years from now, it's most likely part of this, uh, uh, the, the people here to design and then for some maybe some events that happen 30 years from now. So we need to take, we need to consider this. We will have other learners, students, so maybe it's time to have a, um, strategical, a strategical approach, but this cannot be done in a mandatory way. So with this, uh, the, ch the world also changes. Preet, uh, will you tell us about what has changed in the world and are we in the era of crisis or have we always been there and how we ended up there? So what's the ecosystem that we need to consider within the next 30 years? Yes, thank you. Uh, hello to everyone. I'm glad to be here thinking alongside you. Um, I don't know if uh, giving me the floor is the good idea here, but uh, you'll find out soon. Uh, education doesn't really have this purpose because we don't know where it will lead. Uh, education has a, p a point and the point is that uh, it's meant f to protect the world from people with uh, little knowledge. And for many people, uh, human is one of the most uh, complicated systems ever. And uh, uh, it's the complete dilettants who are responsible for the mass production of that. When uh, my children were born, then uh, in the beginning, I was euphoric. Uh, when the first child was born, I w didn't have a higher education with the second child I already had. But I didn't have a clue what I was supposed to do. Everything happened uh, by uh, trial and error. And the only thing I understood was that the education system where these children are being brought up is very good, very ambitious, but perhaps uh, it's not enough. And then I started testing. I'm lucky I, uh, with my wife, who is a special pedagogue or a um, special needs teacher, but uh, I was quite confused myself, so I was looking for different opportunities and then a game that we played with the children was when we went to a shop or somewhere outside and the kids' assignment was to try uh, to see 
people and think uh, about what they do or every day that they are who they are or they look like, what they look like physically, what they're wearing, how they behave, what they eat, what sports they do. And my goal at that time among uh, entertaining the kids uh, days was uh, so that they would uh, notice more things uh, in the public space but to actually raise uh, attention because I had no idea where it would lead and I wasn't even able to word it but the results and I don't know bec whether because of these games but uh, now they're older they're both students then at some point I noticed uh, that it's extraordinary how they have learned to see relationships. They have learned to see the invisible. And this perhaps is a challenge of education. I think everybody knows, uh, maybe not absolutely everyone, but how to recognize basketball players in uh, in the wild. Uh, yeah, they're very tall, but you know how, th th how they walk because different sports have their different quirks. So if uh, someone's played the ball for a long time and done uh, thousands of uh, tries, then see how their hands are going. Some of you may seem that, you know, the, the wrist is barely uh, attached to the arm. But this is for right-handed people. But uh, the left wrist, is it the same for women as it is for men? So uh, the point of education in my mind uh, could uh, among other things be to try and think how some things are actually possible and now I'm in a situation as a parent and I confirm uh, this kind of stereotype uh, where I'm be talking about things that uh, I don't really know of and I try to do it uh, through crisis so this is not a crisis, this is a uh, historian, Aldur Wunk. I've met him a couple of times and uh, last time I'm doing a film with students and a lot of students have decided to leave the impression that they don't know much about uh, uh, near history. So they, uh, it's uh, big in um, interior security. So uh, we're actually interviewing historians for this so they could be able to talk why we need to know history through examples and why um, uh, not knowing history, what can challenges that may pose. So one of the historians that I had was Aldur Wunk, an extraordinary man with an extraordinarily good uh, sense of humor, has a very good social nerve, speaks very clearly Actually, he would, you, us here in the Security Sciences Academy could be interested in him because he's looked into migration issues. Uh, but uh, he was talking about the arrival of pilgrims to Estonia and different parts of Estonia. And then we agreed to meet at the Central Library of Pärnu. And I don't have this kind of dignified boss uh, qualities to be late everywhere. So I was even the 15 minutes early. And then I see, uh, and I look behind, S this is Aldur Wunk. He had showed up even earlier. And when he turned around, uh, then this man showed up. I was quite uh, uh, frightened. But if you look at the two, it seemed uh, there's a similarity there. And in education, one of the things uh, is a familiar uh, similarity. So to try and phrase certain things, Wittgenstein has uh, given us this idea and familiarized us with the idea. So maybe even here we should begin with uh, thinking of crisis in a way that the crises are can be analytically differentiated, but they have a common characteristic and certain characteristics that make them special. And if, um, uh, just to sh shortly sum up the main directions that uh, uh, to cover with you today is to ask, um, is it uh, problematic to think of a crisis as a separately standing case? And why is it useful to handle a crisis, not to solve it? 
And regarding the replies, we need to look at the ecosystems and the a crisis as a process and the hierarchy of problems. In June 2022, an article was published and it's uh, one of the best texts uh, regarding climate uh, these day, uh, in recent times because it also tells us a lot about uh, ecosystems. The authors were four British researchers from different universities. They were all related uh, to the field of uh, ecosystems as well as uh, statistics. The journal where they published is uh, top one in their field. They created a model that they tested on four ecosystems and reached the result that the analysis that we know for ecosystems so far and which are based on one uh, indicator such as uh, the increase of temperature are not very useful to us because uh, they can uh, result in uh, confusing outcomes. After adding certain criteria, uh, it turned out uh, that uh, the collapse of ecosystems can be 38% closer than was expected. So some ecosystems were expected to collapse in uh, 2090, but they might collapse even in uh, 2030, and this is right at our doorstep. What do we do with this knowledge? Well, they also talked about this. This is a text published in uh, the journal called uh, Science in 2018, where authors uh, uh, studied uh, why uh, changes were happening. And uh, they used uh, the logic of networks uh, and uh, the result was that there are two, two types of change. Firstly, domino effect based ones, linear ones, and secondly, other types of change. In their case, we are faced with the unmeasurable. There are some hidden signals uh, which bring about a number of different changes. Looking at social sciences, Colin Hay and uh, Tom, Tom Hunt have uh, edited uh, this uh, research. And uh, they say that uh, the economic crisis, uh, the European uh, migration crisis and the uh, political crisis of 2016 are not separate crises, but they are different stages of one single crisis. And we can add to this climate, pandemic and others. Going back to this uh, paper published in Science, authors uh, demonstrate that uh, there are some aspects which have a broader effect than others on overall changes, such as climate change. One issue to consider when we think about uh, problems in the society and education is what are the external factors that affect education. Another tool, or rather something to think about, is the hierarchy of problems. When we think about education, what problem are we solving? We uh, know the uh, cause and result uh, issue where if we're hungry, we just eat uh, a lot of bananas and we are fine. But in other situations, uh, the answer is much more complicated, such as the Rubik's Cube. Uh, you can solve it, but it's hard. And then there are problems that you cannot solve, but you can alleviate. It's like raising a child. Uh, parents read uh, um, fairy tales to them. Uh, Friends say that you should uh, do weed, uh, and uh, other people say other things. Uh, so all these things affect the child, but we don't know what they turn out to be. 
In education as well, we need to think about uh, what we are talking about if we talk about changes in education. Curriculum is not something that we just uh, write down. It's uh, something that should accompany a student when they leave the school. So to conclude, I would say that changes in the society are like are rhizomatic like this image something is constantly changing any starting point can turn into a new sprout and we never know what the most important one is and now a break an intermission intermission in the sense that uh, intermission from uh, education and crisis we are living in a relational uh, w world of networks and uh, we need to have interdisciplinary knowledge and high ability to analyze in order to understand the linear and hidden uh, feedback and there are some uh, occurrences which uh, have more impact than others it is important to know the level of the problem and uh, finally a positive challenge why are crises useful for us because they make us develop they make us look for new solutions and this is the same for education from uh, education questions all the way to uh, climate questions we could say that uh, criminal behavior is uh, important in the society because it defines the border between the good and the bad. Thank you, Brit. Now, uh, whether we will have uh, such nice life for the next 30 years, whether we can teach uh, our children to deal with crises that uh, occur for 2 to 12 days, well, we now realize that we can't uh, teach them to watch uh, how the storm is raging at the sea. We need to uh, teach them how to swim. Do we have any questions from the audience? I can see that there are no questions on WorkSup yet, but there's a question from the audience. Christina, please wait for the microphone. Good afternoon. I'm Anika Moore. I'm from uh, the Academy of Security Sciences. I hope this uh, question is not uh, too much of a simplification. But if we take crises, for instance, crises uh, from the years 2020 and 2021, for a long time, the topics of uh, security have not been as much a focus as they have now, as they are now. Can we? Um, see a connection there the so children who are wondering or oh, uh, young people who are wondering uh, what to study are they studying uh, more uh, uh, security topics i have no idea but i know that the anthology of uh, security is made up of uh, two topics this is uh, uh, related to psychology actually in the 50s uh, swedish psychologist ericsson said that uh, there is a line between inner and outer security it's not about indicators these are just characteristics that can assess um, uh, security but uh, this is not the definition now trying to answer your question I uh, actually do not know but it seems to me that uh, people are in need of order and uh, understanding and uh, this is happening in a state of uh, there being so much unknown in the past uh, decade one of the main clarifications in security science is that the aspect of uh, unmeasurability has been clarified before it used to be about uh, the borders disappearing outside the situation but actually, the unmeasurability is largely caused by people themselves. And the more aware people are, the more different uh, points of view there are for different questions.
questions, the more different solutions there are and ways of reaching the solutions. So I think uh, the need for order is perhaps uh, one of the drivers that have uh, caused the fact that uh, more people are studying uh, security sciences. Thank you. And we had one more question from the audience. A philosophical thought. If we think of a child as a reflection of their parent and they learn a lot from the parent's behavior, what is the parent's choice? How should a parent educate themselves in order to guide the child in the right direction with the right behavior in the educational sense? I have no idea. I hope Greta will answer this question. I really do not know. It seems like a good idea to think a lot, not be happy with, uh, content with what you have. I think you need to test uh, different ways of thinking, different ways of seeing the world. This sounds like a good idea, it, like it takes you somewhere, but I don't know where it will take you. Thank you. We don't have any questions uh, from WorkSup. Perhaps uh, Greta can decide whether to later answer this question uh, during her turn. But in uh, security, uh, indeed, uh, we have uh, our own people who are just uh, born uh, these days and uh, who will study security sciences in the next 30 years. You could say that we are in a good uh, place right now because uh, the people who feel insecure now and don't know what's going on in the world right now, please come and study security sciences. I understand that this is harder than it first seems, but I think this is a good moment to conclude. We need to think about uh, foreign students and understand that the world is much more complicated than it seems and it's important to think. So Greta, how could we change uh, teaching or is teaching even possible? Is it all about learning and conditions for learning, creating these conditions? Thank you for these questions. Uh, good afternoon. When I entered through the main gate today, I uh, recognized a red uh, brick uh, building. Uh, this is because I have been a member of the Defense League uh, since the war in Georgia, and I've gone to this building. They uh, uh, carried out a uh, training that was many years ago, and. Uh, they asked me if I was a member of the Defence League and I said no, I was a, sci a child psychologist. I would say that uh, if the world feels insecure, then a very good idea is to study. It's better to uh, know things than not. Wh which uh, of you are related to education, perhaps are learning something? Who is related to teaching? Teaches something, supports teaching. Teaching is teaching, regardless who you are teaching and uh, what the developmental uh, elements are. But uh, learning is universal. If I know how children learn, it doesn't mean that I can't teach adults. I thought a lot about um, higher education in general and I would like to ask you perhaps someone can answer does the uh, Academy of uh, Security Science analyze how well a student is able to learn how well they are able to learn at the, during the middle of their studies and at the end of the studies so do their study skills improve okay I see 
The reason why I ask this question is because uh, regardless if we are looking at the perspective of 30 years or climate change, any other crisis, uh, yes, I guess uh, the migration crisis means we'll have more refugees from uh, deserted areas, but we need to keep learning. Whether we are in the formal education system or not, and we must also support the um, uh, community accepting uh, different ideas regarding foreign students' uh, language skills. I uh, I am certain that we don't teach Estonian the way that the brain sh wants to learn it, and uh, nobody else should teach Estonian apart from us Estonians. If we live in this large global family, then uh, it seems pointless to teach in a silly way. So let's focus on the learner. The most uh, useful thing f would be to get uh, students uh, to be uh, independent so that they know how to learn. They can guide their own learning uh, process. They know where they want to get to, how it's possible. During uh, learning, they are able to analyze if they're doing the right thing or something different, and later they can look back and analyze what they have done. But the difficulty is that uh, we can't learn from on the basis of uh, existing skills. What is the biggest issue with efficient uh, learning? Bad food? That is the second biggest uh, concern. The m main issue is that we don't uh, think ourselves how it would be wise to learn. Science tells us how it would be wise to learn. And uh, the science tells us that uh, the, best, uh, the methods that are considered the best are actually uh, not good and they can even be dangerous. Uh, can anybody give me an example of what I've just uh, said? or opposed to this idea. Okay, nobody wants to. So let me give you an example. For instance, if a student needs to learn a simple motor skills and uh, they have to automate it in a crisis situation, what would be a good way of learning it? You can just uh, shout and I will say it into the microphone. This is uh, maybe a rhetorical question. You can also just think about it. You don't have to put it in words. Or maybe somebody wants to. Have you thought about how to distinguish uh, short-term performance from long-term learning? Do you think... Why does this happen? So we can differentiate these two. We are able to take our brain to the position where it can perform very well. And often the actions that take us to uh, great uh, performance don't promote long-term learning. What we always want is as community and as an education institution is not to give short-term knowledge. We want permanent knowledge that can be activated when necessary. So you need to be able to recognize a situation and activate the right skill. And uh, secondly, transferability. So the content uh, in your brain, so it could be a habit and knowledge it's something that's in your brain, in your memory, and it has to be transferable. So you 
uh, the student needs to recognize it in a situation that's difficult from the learning situation. I apologize that I'm constantly moving. The cameraman probably finds it difficult. But anyway, when we talk about crisis, luckily we are not always in a crisis. We uh, tend to have problems every now and then. And that means that learning can only be called learning if uh, the knowledge is permanent, even if you don't have to use it all the time. For example, if a pilot has a problem in the plane uh, every three years, they are able to automatically recognize the problem and deal with it the way that you need to. And there's no time to take out the handbook. Did you know that perfect performance right after learning is often a sign that there will not be any long-term learning. And on the contrary, if someone struggles during uh, their studies, uh, they ask questions, uh, they are actually learning, but it doesn't uh, show externally yet. So these are the principles of memory. Now let me give you a short uh, task. You have three minutes for it. Please have a look at this list. Which strategies of these are useful and uh, which are detrimental? So uh, the list uh, one intensively uh, practicing or drilling something. Uh, op second, open reminding. Uh, taking the material from your memory, so writing down from memory and going through from memory. Three, uh, practicing different things um, in a mixed way so that uh, you can't uh, actually acquire the first thing bef and, and you already go on to the second thing. Fourth is writing everything through based on the materials. For example, making a conspect to yourself. Five is uh, practicing in a practiced way. But at the moment, it seems that uh, the most useful one of them is two. Uh, then we have number six, which is repeated reading. And number six, uh, seven is uh, learning the same thing in different uh, situations. But if we talk about learning simple things, they could be more complex things as well. We talk about memory, then uh, in order for something to sink in in the memory, it's uh, necessarily for the person to teach their memory this knowledge and then and they would teach themselves to retrieve this from their memory and they need to get this knowledge from their long-term memory and it's impossible to uh, memory it for it when i read look at slides i'm at the lecture if i repeatedly read something why can you not rem remember something because the external uh, information source activates these neurons from the outside. So you don't remember anything. So why it's uh, dangerous to drill or to repeatedly read something, it's dangerous that you waste time. You don't enable or allow this uh, knowledge, these neuron connections uh, re to reactivate. These ne things need to be in the memory, and then they try and find them from the memory. And when they do this, where they work hard, then it uh, lets you know that they have to be in there. But the question is um, to all of our students who uh, uh, study internal security, for example, are they aware of that? Are they studying like that? Why don't they know? I don't know why they don't know. So with all these strategies, Uh, Taltec, uh, Tallinn Technical University asked us a long time ago how we should learn and now Tallinn University has asked us the same question and what we do is uh, a good source is the same understanding how uh, uh, students approach to teaching changes during studying and then this enables to detect us uh, the teachers who are unable to support learning and we can offer targeted help but this is just one topic so uh, universities are starting to understand uh, i'm okay to just go a few few minutes over time i'm gonna skip a part but um, 
let's say that whatever needs to be studied, it's complicated, it's complex. They need to go through a safety law, physics, law of physics uh, at the same time. And see if that also make sure that the enemy doesn't come. So if you need to study something uh, complex, it also needs to be automatic. And it's a situation where impulsive reactions uh, cannot prevail. So simple things as a memory principle are easy to acquire. But if we need to create a new concept in our head that entails different fields, a different knowledge, deep knowledge, and also the solutions can vary. They can be flexible and they have to be uploaded or downloaded at the same time and become a, the natural behavior. So what is then important when we're studying then? So there are different strategies. Uh, two teachers have different strategy for uh, teaching complicated things. Uh, this is a very familiar slide for a lot of Estonians. So uh, uh, which prefer uh, students should students prefer? Those who uh, kind of perform a theatrical show. Um, uh, for example, those who uh, give the students a complicated problem first and they have to find a solution in small groups and then the teacher sees what's happening and asks directing questions and after that, uh, after jointly provided answers, they will try and see how an expert could uh, solve it. And the other teacher, teacher Y, will teach the um, thematic theory about this issue and provide systematic knowledge and then uh, students can uh, receive a complex problem task and will try and solve it. Uh, unfortunately, the interpretation cannot hear the questions uh, from the room because uh, they're not using a microphone. So basically, we have defined learning and uh, it happens when uh, the learner constructs uh, knowledge. And in both cases, uh, they are learning about something that they don't know. And so, so what happens then? They construct it. What happens here and what happens then? So in the second bracket, it already happens um, when they're at work. It's qu quite a nice idea, but it's the most important uh, idea. It, it affects the pre-knowledge, and the benefit of that is that the new knowledge will be linked to earlier knowledge system, which makes it uh, memorable later on. And if they are unable to do it, then this knowledge is very difficult to remember later on. But another thing happens here. Uh, one of the most important things in learning that's uh, useful that we do then until may um, our studies are still being funded. So we know, based on many sources, that uh, learning is most efficient when you're given an, uh, an opportunity to do efficient mistakes. So we should think uh, that other things will also happen. So these are perhaps uh, very important things, but what happens is that the learner finds out or finds out better what the true nature of the problem. And if they have a um, teacher why, then they only realize the issue of the problem when they start to work. Then they realize what is important. Perhaps it's something that you have all uh, experienced in your life, but it's not cost effective. It doesn't make sense. Uh, keep, uh, and secondly, the teach the teacher has an idea that, that they don't understand what is being the students are talking about. And perhaps the other side that's important, why um, where everyone gets together, it's very polite. Uh, students are politely quiet and the teachers uh, think that they understood everything. Only one person has to think in the room, so that's the teacher. 
I've uh, thought uh, you you should have uh, physical education lessons so that the teacher is running on the stadium and the kids are looking at it. It, it works out the same. Because all this pre-knowledge activation is cancelled because if one is... Uh, talking then otherwise the other people are unable to uh, activate their knowledge uh, but uh, also people are not able to state their ideas so that no one knows this uh, new uh, on what this new knowledge is being built on so one is the illusion of studying that it's very clear it all makes sense but it uh, should be a bit more blurry. And the message is not that uh, there is no lecture, it's that this lecture should be after the issue, but the feeling that if the teacher starts with explaining something, then you will have an illusion that uh, you are looking at someone else's knowledge and you feel like you're studying, but looking at someone else's knowledge uh, isn't studying, you need to organize that. So this is the uh, inefficient success so I can kind of manage and it masks that no studying, actually learning took place. But perhaps we go through the same thing. Um, I'll be quiet uh, now. There's lots of research that this works. But how do we get so that the students are using the most efficient learning strategies and so that the students know that uh, it's um, sensible to study with uh, efficient strategies? that they would be the most active uh, thinkers, that they would construct knowledge. They don't want the solutions to be told to them. But for example, if I ask the population about things at home, then I don't tell them, I ask. So, seven minutes exactly. So I'll give the floor over. Or I, I, are there any questions? Thank you. Do we have any questions from the room? Yes. I would really like to thank for this wake-up call. I had a question. We've been uh, discussing for a day and a half about how to raise public awareness, how to manage crisis. And uh, Grete, you reflected this learner's role and someone who studies at school uh, is is this learner and they take the responsibility that I'm going to learn. But now the rest uh, 1.3 million people who don't ha have that role, so how will they get this new knowledge? Yes, it's quite uh, exciting. Uh, we haven't really been thinking about it before on how to do it because we have officials who have everyday contact with these people. So maybe if the you think through the dialogue because the best form of teaching is the dialogue and if we come up with these uh, questions and uh, one of the Lisa's uh, scientific publication is about stupid and clever questions but the questions can be that uh, will actually don't really develop the one who answers uh, or they can be the ones where you do educate the answer. The success of this would be that things would be improved, so we would see that if we direct people to construct this knowledge, the more complex knowledge, then uh, more times we have to do it. And perhaps there are Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's very popular to play with artific uh, artificial uh, intelligence at the moment, chat GDP, for example. Does it help uh, knowledge, to construct knowledge, and helps you get uh, smarter in a learning sense? In the sense that if you're doing learning tasks, uh, or you do a, for students, uh, let chat GDP to answer a question, like an exam question, and the student's uh, question is to analyze that uh, 
what is silly about the answer because the expert understands that it's wrong because although it will even seem maybe in time it will say maybe in time chat gdp will fool teachers already but the world is th that will all change i'm unable to say but as a teacher i'm not afraid of it i don't do uh, I don't have uh, exams where they could use uh, AI to answer questions. Uh, but if, if they could, then the student realized that AI, AI had the correct answer, and that's enough for me. Thank you. No uh, questions from, uh, from online. So it's a last, uh, as based on the last uh, part of Greta's presentation, I can't say that we, uh, we have understood things the same way and we have the same knowledge uh, because the fact that we've been listening, it doesn't mean we know, but at least we've heard the three presentations and we've heard the one thing. Yes, our previous knowledge is different, but what, uh, in your assessment, can we conclude based on that? Do we have anything that the academy in order to in 30 years to be uh, continue to be successful and to teach the right things or to create an environment where the uh, students are learning the right things so uh, we could uh, keep Estonian society safe. We, what are the first steps to take? Uh, I'll give the floor to the panelists and then maybe we'll have questions or observations as well. I will just start uh, asking questions here. Uh, the call marks of organizational theory uh, says if someone asks what organizations should do, then uh, then he says that if someone asks how things should be done, uh, these people should be fired if they don't know it. But perhaps I will carry on with uh, Grete's uh, way of thinking what to do or what to think about. Uh, if my, as my field is organizations, then a study organization, is, there's nothing new. And if public uh, organizations would try to less with public administration and would understand that successful organizations or future successful organizations, their staff, are in an organization where the organization of work and design is based on the principle that uh, the result will come, it won't be achieved. So this is kind of a public administration logic interpretation, but it's not the easiest. Thank you. Christy. I'm not an uh, educational uh, scientist, but uh, based on the presentations today, it seems to me that the key question is to go along with the changing world, to be flexible, to consider these uh, changing uh, knowledge or the new knowledge that we have collected about uh, learning how it will take place in an effective way. Um, I'm going to requote myself, but uh, the question is not about what to study, but how to uh, study and how to get people to become independent learners. What, what is useful for them and what is not useful for learning? So this would be a dream of mine. Uh, my dream is like uh, we, uh, that the teachers will be not needed just as no one checks whether you wash your hands or not. Then we sh at the same time, we should have uh, no one checking on, on learners. So there will then become a new pack of information and then we should be aware how to acquire this. Thank you. Uh, anyone who would like to ask a question? Christina, could you help? So we have two questions. Thank you. If we talk about crisis, even in the title, uh, overcoming the crisis, uh, should we then uh, call out crisis for us to learn and the population to learn? And obviously, how do we define a crisis? 
the, this is a more philosophical view. If we talk about life as a changing cycle, then crises are just new stages in this changing cycle where we are facing a situation where we think we don't have the skills and the knowledge and we try to find solutions. So it's uh, indeed a situation where everyone is creative. But also the learning part, which what happens when we don't have this pre-knowledge, when we, where there's no knowledge, where do we start uh, learning then? Yes, we don't have that situation. Someone has some knowledge, even maybe on how to use a tool. Uh, or uh, I'm not going to use an axe to saw something. So these kind of logical uh, things that people should know, but uh, our progress towards uh, a well-being society has been noticeable. A lot of uh, young people have uh, forgotten about logical things that, for example, you need to survive in the wild. So there are certain skills that are being taught, but also in, in warfare they say that uh, they always prepare for the last war so they learn from what has been without knowing what is coming and this has also been demonstrated by the war in the Ukraine that with the drones no one had seen that uh, no one uh, was able to predict that this will happen therefore isn't it so that we should urge people and give them courage to act in different situations and this uh, creative freedom not only to teach them in the to be helpless who are uh, waiting for the state to come and help them Uh, but also the question from the previous uh, panel, uh, the question for the previous panel was kind of the same from me. But uh, should we actually call out crisis uh, um, so we would be better prepared for them? Obviously, we can't get prepared for everything in the end because we don't know what life will bring. Um, Yes, a sensible learning does play take place that we simulate crisis, nothing happens, no one dies, but what we do, a group of people with the Estonian Nature Fund, we have a climate school and then we realize that if we think about different crises, uh, then the crises are being kept separate, but uh, they actually come happen if this hot weather, then at the same time we'll have a lot of rain that will destroy all the crops and then we have a migration and then energy and then something. So we should actually prepare for a cluster crisis because we often tend to prepare if one crisis is dead, the other one definitely won't come, which is, uh, it's correct. In order to learn, we need to create when this crisis isn't there yet. It's like a definition of life, what is life and what is lifeless, but the life is alive is who can prevent future changes. Trees, animals can, people so far have can, maybe in the future they can't, but this could be what we do. And if young people, just to come back to comment on the young uh, topics, they are, kind of uh, forgetting about the skills, how to survive in the wild. This is this is our fault. We should create uh, an environment for them where they should learn to do that, but we're not doing that. Thank you. We have one more question. Again, um, I have talked a little bit about what we called participatory governance. And I'd like to introduce a new word to you. I understand you are a psychologist. Was that right? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. correct. And I would like to introduce participatory teaching, meaning how can you involve the students to get engaged more in the teaching? 
And uh, I have an 18-year-old. That's my youngest. And uh, I do see that he is fixed to his iPhone all the time. And I think that's the case with all kids all over the world today in that age. So that's, uh, I don't have the answers to all, all this, but you probably are closer to give the answers. But uh, I also see, and, uh, uh, see that those who go practical, like being um, uh, car mechanics or being into health, uh, more practical ways, they are more engaged. So how do you do this? By engaging them in the circle of participating in the teaching. Don't answer it, I have another comment as well. So, and one thing I read in the papers is, you have to see me as a, as a student, as a, and the teacher doesn't see me. And that's also about how do you get them to participate. Uh, to the first one, um, I hope that we can continue to have a global uh, teaching system, that we don't shut that down because of the security crisis. However, in Norway, no, in Troms, I think it's in Tromsø or in Trondheim, they discovered and they think he's an agent of, sleeping agent of uh, Putin regime. And he is now, uh, he is detained and they are trying to investigate him. They can't find his past and things like that. So we don't, we, we cannot be naive. We try to open the society with teaching, but we need also to check very closely what kind of people we get in. We have to do both things, I think. But continue, because we can influence these people coming from the different countries. They see how we live. They see an open society. And that, I think, is very important to teach them. So those are my comments. I don't have answers to all this, but I'd just like to comment. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, maybe my slides weren't in English, weren't they? So actually, I would say that uh, participatory learning is a step too little. What I was talking about was a learning process where the learner is the one who constructs the knowledge and the expert is the one who helps uh, this process, but never gives the answers in the first place, but creates a situation when, where the mistake can occur, but not a um, sloppy mistake, not a random mistake, but mistake uh, that's concerning, that concerns the main concept what need to be learned. This is the point, and participatory is for me kind of euphemism. So give them some vague and uh, like uh, shallow role, but actually I am the teacher. I'm I'm saying that today we know so much. We need the maxim maximum cognitive engagement, not just engagement. And we know that the more um, the role of the thinker is. Uh, by the students or in the students group, not by the teacher, the better. And the second topic, uh, the, the teacher doesn't see me, it's it's huge topic. And this is also one what, what we teach in my university, in Tallinn University, it's related to motivation. And it's related to students' three basic psychological needs. I don't know how much you consider them in uh, this academy, but uh, this is actually maybe even the, the more important topic. So actually what you refer to is uh, the, the missing feeling of relatedness. And if it's, if it's not there, then no good learning ever happens. So actually we need to think about it really a lot. And uh, supporting three basic needs is really difficult thing. It's not easy and it's very easy to, uh, uh, to, to suppress them. And it's also possible to su uh, support and suppress them at the same time, which is bad as well. Thank you for this answer. Thank you also uh, for the great uh, comments and questions uh, from the audience. We have less than two minutes remaining. I understand uh, that uh, those who are expecting answers to a question, what the academy will be like in 30 years. Well, Thanks to you, we reached the understanding that uh, we will have new people, we will have new challenges, and what we need to do is learn to teach. We've given uh, an overview of the first uh, uh, two of the elephant, not of the entire elephant. But uh, now 15 minutes for each of you to share what else you would like to tell the audience. 
the task of the teacher is not to tell students uh, what they have learned, but to create uh, possibilities for learning in order to for uh, students uh, to uh, learn to create links in the environment, not in the society, but in the environment. Learning in the future will be much more personalized, uh, I believe, and uh, more digital tools will be used. I am very glad to have noticed that uh, in the Academy of Security Sciences, we are moving towards this. I think we're moving in the right direction. Learning is something that you can analyze using uh, scientific research. We already have a lot of uh, research results, but uh, we are not using all the data that we have. I think every teacher has uh, uh, needs to let students learn and stop excessive teachers teaching. And Secondly, how to uh, create uh, opportunities for these uh, fruitful situations to happen. Thank you uh, to all the panelists and thank you to the audience as well.
meil, meil õnnestuski siis. Welcome back to uh, the main room. Thank you to all the panelists, uh, to all leaders of panels and uh, for active participants. Now I would like to give you the floor to summarize uh, what was mentioned in your panels and then we will summarize the day. Kalina. My uh, workshop uh, focused on uh, uh, critical services and um, uh, whether uh, we were uh, dependent on um, uh, these. What uh, we found uh, was that uh, it's uh, important to adapt uh, to situations, whether security situations or other types of uh, crises. We must um, be willing to withstand a short-term uh, uh, disconnection or power cut uh, until things normalize. Three things I'd like to uh, point out uh, that were mentioned were firstly when uh, talking about the availability of services then uh, depending on how available the service is uh, there are more risks for cross-contamination economic uh, se safety security is uh, very important if a service is not financially available or you cannot purchase it then it basically is not available it's also very important um, uh, to think about the safety of employees uh, when uh, we think about uh, the uh, rest, uh, fixing of uh, cutoffs the staff must remain uh, safe and people's uh, coping with learnt helplessness is also something that, uh, to bear in mind. These were the main points. I will uh, take over from Galina. The panel that uh, I led uh, focused on uh, civil protection and uh, effects of um, war. I would like to highlight uh, two of the most uh, important uh, elements that stayed with me after this panel. Firstly, it is clear that if we talk about uh, military threats or military protection, we don't all only talk about uh, um, uh, soldiers or the military being out uh, in the field we talk about the entire society being at war therefore military defense uh, civil protection preparedness for crisis uh, by individuals are uh, the important uh, things that need to come all together in our pan panel we moved even further and uh, talked about uh, what we can learn from ukraine it's important uh, to think about how life can carry on during a war. This is uh, what we can see in Ukraine. Life uh, goes on and this matters. So how to ensure this and how to prepare for this in advance? A very interesting question that um, our panel received was uh, regarding uh, critical thinking in any crisis situation and how to maintain it, how to foster it. There was a very good uh, word uh, in English. Dauna, could you remind me? Consciousness. And uh, this uh, term is Uh, 
alone uh, in a crisis uh, is uh, something that uh, we cannot just say. If we say that, then the state and local governments uh, must be prepared to give uh, up-to-date and timely information to uh, the uh, residents. But um, I think uh, generally we were able to uh, give uh, quite good uh, instructions. Uh, to Michael, how did your panel go? So uh, my turn. Uh, our group's uh, topic was uh, local governments as an important resource in uh, aiding the population. And all uh, local government uh, leaders who participated uh, understood this very well. They were very optimistic. If I asked about problems, but uh, as my second question, then there were no problems. And then it turned out that the state uh, should uh, finance the activities, uh, all the tasks that local governments have. But we also realized that in the today's panel, and those who were he present here today are all have their own quirks and the uh, common understanding that we should have more managers of local governments with quirks and that would rescue Estonia. And the second topic was, uh, or third or fourth even, that everyone has understood that the local government should uh, uh, add uh, role into their structures who would be responsible for civil protection because even for the quirky managers it's too uh, big of a workload to their daily tasks. Uh, we don't have the budget for it at the moment but it's only a matter of time as uh, we constantly uh, heard that the more crises there are the larger or the bigger the preparedness for them, so that was the main keyword. Uh, plans were also considered very important so that it wouldn't just be documents, but it also turned out that uh, alongside with the, the local governments have two plans. One plan is what we show to the officials uh, who uh, monitor us, but the second plan is the real plan that we have, but we won't show that to anyone because it's not uh, uh, pursuant to legal acts. We we actually have an actual plan. So this was an a interesting uh, conclusion, but I've heard that before. And they also uh, highlighted their role with communities and cooperation and as an end result we concluded that if there's a crisis time and when you need to solve these things then the state uh, should uh, ask us uh, less stupid questions and surveys uh, they only hinder uh, solving the crisis and don't help and uh, i would like to say that please give us very specific tasks give us money to do these tasks, and then we'll be very successful. Our group tried to find answers to the question uh, on what should uh, be the innovation of research and science in education in 30 years, so it be in accordance with the internal security. We had three panelists with uh, Christy who uh, showed uh, learning uh, mobility and the trends and what it could look like in the near future and what we should consider. And although we didn't find an answer to the question of uh, what uh, it would be regarding internal security, but that always depends on the school. But if we consider that the society has is globalizing regarding certain safety, then this could be uh, perhaps the um, direction in internal security in the next 30 years. Preet uh, showed us that, um, that 
the idea that we are moving from one crisis to another can be uh, deceptive. Uh, it's probably the different phases of one larger crisis, and there are several phenomena uh, enabling us to uh, describe the crisis uh, with its different characteristics, but uh, there's a lot we haven't noticed. So in order to successfully manage crisis and to develop or to design uh, education so that al alumni in the academy would handle these crises, we must uh, teach them to notice the wider spectrum that uh, this crisis or the crisis or the changes in the society and our ecosystems bring along, and uh, the change in complex systems can be quicker than we think it is because we have less time to adjust or to be ready for changes than we think. And Crete showed that we can't really teach. We can make the learners want to learn and also uh, based on the questions asked we talked about uh, Participatory uh, learning, which is also something that uh, we should take into consideration how to make the student uh, study, how to can we have the situations in front of them that they actually need to solve and perhaps they will then make their mistakes and learning before they go somewhere to work and uh, will then be paid uh, for making mistakes. So uh, we didn't just receive uh, one good answer how the next uh, 30 years the academy uh, should uh, influence the uh, education and internal security, but there are several things that we should consider and uh, we sh that we should be innovative with. So in that 30 years, we can say that our alumni are, uh, have, are, have coped well with changes in the society so that the results uh, aren't achieved, they arrive. Our task is to ensure that the results that come are appropriately fitted into the society and where we want to be. So, thank you. And as an organizer of the whole conference, I have the good opportunity to conclude this uh, conference. Uh, I will uh, uh, introduce myself. Uh, my, I am the uh, head, Janis Otsla, and the head of the Rescue College. But uh, with the organization of this conference, these uh, two days uh, as an organizer, I didn't have my full attention. Be, as it tends to be with organizers, but at the same time, uh, I had a very good opportunity to observe this conference and enjoy it. And I think these two days have been very successful. And I can also disclose uh, this recipe uh, of a good conference, then the recipe is that uh, find the right people and know those who know. And if you uh, have these prerequisites, then most likely you can have a very good conference. Uh, just if we talk about the, the background or the backstage, then I uh, remind uh, Urmas Vaino said, why are we here? Why are we organizing a civil protection conference? Then as you remember, he also mentioned that 30 years ago, the Academy of Securities uh, Science had the Rescue College, um, started providing education and also in Väike Mari as well. So this is a significant year where we, it's been 30 years when we started <coughs> rescue training, including uh, civil protection studies. And if we come back to the reasons why we need this conference, then we've also discussed with the rescue board about uh, uh, we, how we need, uh, in addition to civil protection courses, we need a format where not only top level managers could have discussions, 
but uh, and and perhaps only a few people could participate but we also need a good conference format where that would include a lot of other experts who could uh, take part of these discussions that we have on the state level and the civil protection uh, conference this actually fulfilled this purpose and uh, in addition we have another important reason uh, there's a saying as we kind of all know each other by name and we know what people say and think then this talking to each other uh, year to year without uh, anything new doesn't get you far either so stirring the soup uh, quicker doesn't make the soup th thicker and this was the reason why we had the academic side added and foreign experts who would share their knowledge for in their countries, in their organizations, what is uh, the outside view and wh what is civil protection in other countries. So, and uh, these two days really fulfill this goal. And uh, to conclude, I would really like to thank everyone. I would like to thank the participants, especially those who uh, showed up two days. Uh, and uh, although yesterday was quite a difficult day by the evening and we managed very well, and in crisis it's often that days are longer, we need to uh, get used to that and I would like to thank all the speakers who uh, shared their experiences with us. It was very important for us that you opened yourself and shared your ideas and I would uh, really like to thank uh, our foreign speakers. It wasn't uh, the easiest to get them to speak here and still we um, actually managed to uh, get all the people that we, we planned to get here. So one report uh, was out. It was the Israeli uh, um, presentation that we planned in the summer, and the timing was perfect. But we're because we did couldn't contact the speaker over the last couple of days, then we actually had to replace it. And because everybody wanted to talk, as you noticed yesterday, then Ormas had to work hard to orchestrate the whole event. Then we just used this time. And regarding panels, I would uh, highlight separately the, the leaders of the panels. These were those who thought through the topics and who sought uh, people to the panel, so who could be in one or the other field, uh, those experts who that people would like to listen to them and discuss with them. So it was a wonderful um, discussions had today and was a successful day. And of course, uh, most important and biggest thanks will go to our team. The people that you perhaps didn't notice, but who were running back and forth and behind us and, and were responsible for this successful conference. They really worked hard, and not just uh, the last couple of weeks, but since the summer where this work has been going on so that everything would be successful. Let's have a big round of applause. And separately, I would uh, highlight Ingrid. We've had uh, been discussing that Ingrid feels a bit weak in civil protection. She wants to know more. And what could be better than to replace Urmas Vaino with Ingrid so that she could be a part of the conference and through that uh, we would have a better understanding about what uh, civil protection really means and Ingrid, we had an agreement with Ingrid that, that she will also uh, attend a civil protection exercise courses. So thank you Ingrid. And our conference is officially uh, over with this. I hope uh, you got what you wanted to get from it. Uh, have a safe journey home and I'll see you soon in our new formats and new opportunities. Thank you.